Okay, we're going to continue. Uh, we just finished talking about the first, shall we call it the main line of prophecy uh, that came out of uh, Genesis 3.15, the Proto-Evangelum, uh, which basically was uh, uh, the first gospel message uh, that was shared to man in, in Genesis, the future Messiah, uh, that the, the seed of the woman is going to crush uh, Satan down the road, uh, and we found out that the seed of the woman will also come from the seed or the line of Abraham. Later we found out it will come from the lion of the tribe of Judah, uh, Jacob's uh, son Judah. Uh, then we found out later uh, also it's going to come from the line of David. There was some very powerful prophecy there where God is going to establish his throne through the line of David. And then we found out also in uh, Psalms chapter 2 uh, that uh, the seed of the woman will be the anointed one, the Mashiach, the Messiah. So let's continue on because there's a lot more here. And let's discuss the marriage of the Lamb. This is going to be very, very special. So first of all, I need to tell a story. Uh, but this is such an important story. So, please bear with me. Okay, first of all, let's go back to the Abrahamic Covenant. And the Abrahamic Covenant was an unconditional covenant. So it's a covenant that there was no conditions. You could call it a forever Abrahamic Covenant. And forever, I'm not kidding. This is what God says. In Genesis 17, he says, I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and and you, you being Abraham, and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, that will be the future of Israel, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. So has this occurred? No, it has not. But we've seen bits and pieces of it being fulfilled. But is the land been given to the people of Israel as an everlasting possession? Uh, and forever, they're, he's going to, God will be their God? No, we have not seen that yet. Okay, this is explained further in Psalms 105, where... You, his servants, the descendants of Abraham, his, meaning God's chosen ones, the children of Jacob. He is Yahweh, our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever. The promise he made for a thousand generations. The covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree to Israel, as an everlasting covenant. To you, I will give the land of Canaan as a portion you will inherit. So this is a very important part of the Abrahamic covenant. Now, we know how the story goes. Uh, the, the, the children of Israel, of Jacob, they find themselves in Egypt, and not only they find themselves in G Egypt, but now they're bound as slaves and working for uh, an evil pharaoh. So um, God reveals himself, or Yahweh reveals himself to Moses in the burning bush. And he says in Exodus 6, he says, Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am Yahweh. And I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. And then listen to this. I will take you. The word here for take, laka, it's an application of a verb like a man takes a woman. A man marries a woman as a wife. 
I will laka you. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. It's almost like saying, I will take you to be my wife and I will be your husband. We could say that, right? Then you will know that I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. So this is introducing a very intimate love story. Later in chapter 7, so the very, very next chapter, uh, God says, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and with mighty acts of judgment, I will bring out my divisions, my people, my people, the Israelites, and the Egyptians will know that I am Yahweh when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. He goes on. He says, Yahweh, the, the Lord, Yahweh exercised judgments against Pharaoh's uh, kingdom with progressive intensity. And this is very, very important because this is going to foreshadow what we're going to read about in Revelations with the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. And all these that we're going to see, everything is going to be administered with progressive intensity and intentionality against Satan's kingdom, ultimately to give people an opportunity to repent and come to God. But as we know the story, it doesn't all end that way. So what started off as Moses casting down his snake, which turned into his staff, which turned into a snake, and then the turning the Nile River to blood, and then we got the frogs and the gnats and the flies and the livestock that were killed, and then the boils and the hail and the locusts and the thick darkness, and then the death of the firstborn. There's a couple of things we really need to pay attention to. One is what I just talked about. There's progressive intensity behind this, and this is for a reason and a purpose. But there's two other principles that we really need to look at. One's called the Goshen principle, and we will explain that. And the other is Passover. And obviously both of these, in fact, all of this has very important types and foreshadowing of what we're going to see in Revelation. So let's look at the Goshen principle. The very next chapter, Exodus 8, uh, where God says, but on that day, I will deal differently with the land of Goshen. Now, why is that? Where my people live. No swarms of flies will be there so that you will know that I Yahweh am in this land. Wow. Very next chapter, Exodus 9. The only place it did not hail, and remember this was hail that killed all sorts of livestock. The only place it did not hail was in, you guess it, the land of Goshen, where the Israelites were. And then we have the plague of darkness in, that, in the very next chapter, Exodus 10. Then Yahweh said to Moses, stretch out your hand towards the sky so that darkness spreads over Egypt. Darkness that can be felt. No one could see anyone else or move about for three days. Yet all the Israelites had lights in the places where they lived, that being Goshen. This is a very important principle that we're going to see once again in Revelation. And then there's the Exodus. Chapter 12. On that same night, I will, I being Yahweh, will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am Yahweh. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is very important. Uh, the very next verse, verse 14. This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, to Yahweh, 
a lasting ordinance. And as we know, Passover is so very, very important to our faith. What was Jesus' last Passover dinner, the Lord's Supper? It was celebrating the Passover meal. But what about his crucifixion? The lamb that was slain, Jesus Christ that was slain on the cross, when did that occur? Well, that occurred on Passover. Now, wait a minute. I thought you told me we have a Passover dinner where Jesus shared his Lord's Supper. And then after that dinner, uh, we had a crucifixion where the Passover lamb was slain. That's two different events, two different days. That can't happen. Oh, yes, it can. And this is, once again, just the beauty of God's sovereignty in all this. Okay, back then, in the days of Jesus' crucifixion, you had the northern kingdom, which was called Israel, and you had the southern kingdom, which was called Judea. And guess what? They couldn't agree on anything. This is almost like Republicans and Democrats in our world today. They just could not even agree on what the day of the week was. According to the northern kingdom, and the northern kingdom is, uh, uh, includes the Galilee, in the Galileans, where Jesus and his disciples were, they said that the day started at sunrise. And so it went from sunrise to sunrise. Oh, no, 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 no. The Judeans in the southern kingdom goes, the day starts at sunset. And it goes from sunset to sunset. So which is it? <laughs> I think you know my answer. The answer is yes. And only because this was in place was Jesus Christ allowed to celebrate the Passover, the Lord's Supper, and then afterwards be the Passover lamb between 3 and 5 p.m. in the southern kingdom, because Jerusalem's in the southern kingdom. Only God could have orchestrated this. So just a little side tidbit, but once again, so God is sovereign. That's all I can say. God is sovereign. And because of this disagreement, Jesus Christ could be the Passover meal and the Passover lamb. I mean, it's just utterly amazing. So anyway, moving right along. Uh, so we know that story of the Passover, the crossing of the Red Sea. There's a lot of richness there. We just, we don't have time to go through all of Exodus and, and see the parallels that we will come back and revisit in Revelation. But we do know that the Lord met with his people in the wilderness, right? And Exodus 13 by day, Yahweh. Yahweh went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. So Yahweh was there with them in the pillar, be it the light or the cloud. And then we read in the very next chapter, then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved in front and stood behind them. So wait a minute. I thought this was Yahweh, or is this the angel of God? Now, we also know that quite often uh, theologians agree, and it's pretty unanimous, that the angel of the Lord, the angel of God, is a theophany of Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. But wait a minute, now we're interchanging, it seems like Yahweh and uh, Yeshua in all this. And then a couple of verses later, in verse 24, during the last watch of the night, Yahweh looked down from the pillar of fire and the cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it in confusion. Okay, the important principle here that we want to kind of highlight is that God was with his children in the wilderness. And 
We're going to see that later on in Revelation, in Revelation 12, 6, where the woman, the woman being Israel, fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by her God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days or three and a half years. Also, Song of Solomon, a very, very special book in the Bible. And people sometimes will ask, well, what's so important about Song of Solomon? It is a love story between God and his chosen people. And we read in Song of Solomon 3, verse 6, where it says, Who is this coming from the wilderness? Like a column of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and incense made from all the spices of the merchant. Once again, it's showing a type and a shadow of Yahweh with his people in the wilderness. And we're going to see more of that when we get into Revelation. Okay, um, let's go back to Exodus 6-7. Remember we talked about this very special proposal made by God, by Yahweh, where he says, I will take you. I will take you like a man takes a woman to marry as a wife, as my own people, and I will be your God. Now, God has led the people all the way up to Mount Sinai. And we know a lot happens in Mount Sinai, probably a lot more than people realize. Because now in chapter 19, verse 5, 6, he comes out with a different proposal. And listen to what he says. Now, if... Now, if means now we got a conditional proposal. Uh, so if it's a covenant, it's going to be a conditional covenant, not an unconditional covenant. But he says, now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, out of the whole earth, you will be my treasured possession. Stop and think of what's being said here. The God of all creation is saying out of all people groups on this earth, out of all tribes, out of all nations, if you just obey me and keep my covenant, then you will be my treasured possession. The King of kings and Lord of lords, you will be my treasured possession. This is awesome. This is so powerful. Although the whole earth is mine, you, Israel, will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. I mean, this is just an amazing proposal. And compare this to Revelation uh, chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Just as an introduction, uh, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood, that being Messiah, uh, Jesus Christ, and has made us to be what? A kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father, to him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Once again, Revelation is once again setting the stage of what had been proposed back in Exodus 19, that if you keep my covenant, you will be my treasured possession and you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is just an awesome proposal. So, all of a sudden now, Moses finds himself in the middle, in the middle between uh, proposals that Yahweh is giving and the children of Israel. And in fact, we, we can literally call Moses in all this a matchmaker. And hear me out. So a couple of verses later, Exodus 19, 7 and 8. So Moses went back and he summoned the elders of the people and set them but set before them all the words Yahweh had commanded him to speak. And the people all responded together, quote, we will do everything Yahweh has said. So Moses brought their answer back to Yahweh. So now we got a different covenant. God had given a proposal, a very intimate proposal, and the people have said, yes, we will obey. Now, 
what we have is a betrothal. And a betrothal is a legally binding first phase of a marriage covenant. And if we look at the, the biblical pattern of a marriage ceremony uh, in the Jewish culture, there's four things that we're going to look at. There's the mikveh. The mikveh is a ceremonial washing of the bride that, that the bride undergoes before the wedding ceremony. And then they assemble under what's called a chupa. That's the canopy. Uh, normally you see it like a, like a tent structure where the bride and groom stand under it to read and sign the ketubah. What's the ketubah? The ketubah is a legally binding contract that contains the obligations of both the bride and the groom. So it is the marriage covenant, the marriage covenant, uh, which is really, in one sense, no different than what we celebrate today as husband and wife. We recite our vows, a marriage co covenant. That's what marriage is all about. And then what? The wedding banquet. Let's call it the party. So let's see how this plays out. The mikvah, which is the ceremonial washing. Uh, now, a couple of verses later, Exodus 19, and Yahweh said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them, them being the Israelites, them being the bride, wash their clothes. Ooh, that's a mikveh. And be ready by the third day, because on that day, Yahweh, who's Yahweh in this? The groom will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast, may they approach the mountain. Wow, at the sound of the trumpet. That seems to have revelation overtones. So, is it the very next verse? No. Nope. Two, three verses later. Verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain. Well, what's that thick cloud? That's a, that's a canopy, a chupa, and a very loud trumpet blast. And everyone in the camp trembled. And then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood in front of the mount, at the foot of the mountain. Yahweh descended to the top of Mount Sinai. And what does he do? He calls Moses back to the top of the mountain. And God spoke all these words. What were these words? Well, these words would be the ketubah, the legally binding contract. What we know is the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven, above, or on earth, below, beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, Yahweh, your God, am a jealous, we could use the word husband, am a jealous God. You shall not misuse the name of Yahweh. Your God. Once again, we could say Yahweh, your husband. And in fact, when we compare this to Isaiah 54 5, Isaiah 54 5 says, For your maker is your husband. Yahweh Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. Wow. Yahweh, your maker, is your husband. The Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. Wait a minute, I thought Yeshua was our redeemer. Well, we're starting to see more and more interesting um, combinations here. He is called the God of all the earth. Continues, remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. The seventh day is a Sabbath to Yahweh, your God. Now stop and think about this. If we're putting this in a husband and wife context and picking one day out of the week or the husband and wife just spend that time together, what would we, what would we call that? 
We would call that date night between husband and wife, right? And then we know the rest of the Ten Commandments. To honor your father and mother so that you can live long the land of Yahweh. Your God has given you. You shall not murder, commit adultery, steal, give false testimony against your neighbor, covet anything of your neighbor. Um, and thus are the Ten Commandments. So, a few verses later. When Moses went and told the people all of Yahweh's words and laws, they responded with one voice. Everything Yahweh has said, we will do. Moses then wrote down everything Yahweh had said. He got up early the next morning. He built an altar. Now listen to this. He built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And then he sent young Israelite men and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to Yahweh. Um, burnt offerings are, uh, as we know, are uh, offerings of atonement. Fellowship offerings, well, that's for fellowship, right? For fellowship with uh, Yahweh. Moses took half the blood and put it in bowls, and the other half he splashed against the altar. And then listen, then he took the book of the covenant. What is that? That's the ketubah, the wedding vows. And he read it to the people. They responded, we will do everything Yahweh has said. We will obey. And then the very next verse, listen to this. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant that Yahweh has made with you in accordance with all these words. Now stop and think about this. We were just talking about the Lord's Supper, right? The Passover Supper uh, that Jesus Christ celebrated with his disciples. And when Jesus Christ picked up the cup from the fruit of the vine, what did he say? He said in Matthew 26, 28, this is my blood of the covenant, which was poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then he says something very interesting. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day, that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. That is in Revelation 19. That's how special this is. This is how special it was in Exodus chapter 24. This is how special it was in Matthew 26 at the Lord's Supper. And this is how special it's going to be in Revelations 19 at the marriage of the Lamb. Extremely intimate intimacy with God. I mean, this is just so special. So it's a done deal, right? <clears throat> so let's have the wedding banquet. So a couple of verses later, Exodus 24, 9, Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel under his feet was something like a pavement made of lapsus lazuli, as bright blue as the sky. But God did not raise up his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God. Now, we can definitely connect the dots and, and say they did not see his face, but they saw God and they ate and drank. An amazing, an amazing experience. And then, of course, comes the marriage certificate, right? Exodus 24, 12, Yahweh said to Moses, Come on up to me on the mountain and stay here, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandments. I have written 
for their instruction. So Yahweh himself wrote with his very finger on the, on the tablets of stone the law and the commandments. In verse 18, then Moses entered the cloud and he went up on the mountain and he stayed on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. And then, of course, we know what happens in those 40 days and 40 nights. <clears throat> A few verses later. Then Yahweh said to Moses, go down and listen to this, because your people, not my people, your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. And this Hebrew word for corrupt, which is uh, sahat, is an extremely vicious word. Uh, sahat means to be utterly ruined, destroyed, to bring the ruin. Let me give you two uh, uses of, of context of sahat. When God destroyed man with the flood, with Noah, that was the word. Man had become sahat. When God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with fire, that was the word he used once again. Man had become sahat. Your people, whom you brought out of Egypt, have become sahat, corrupt. They've been quick to turn away from what I commanded them. They have made for themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. I can't even begin to imagine the pain and the agony that our Lord God, Yahweh, felt the utter rejection from the God of all creation. I mean, this is just, this baffles me. I am so baffled that, and thankful that God did not just utterly destroy everybody then. Anyway, the story continues. Exodus 32, 26. <clears throat> so he, Moses, stood at the entrance of the camp and said, whoever is for Yahweh, come to me. And all the Levites rallied to him. And then he said to them, this is what Yahweh, the God of Israel says. Each man strap a sword to his side, go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other, each killing his brother, his friend, his neighbor. The Levites did as Moses commanded in that day. About 3,000 of the people died. And this, by the way, is the reason why the tribe of Levi, the Levites, became the Levitical priesthood because of what they did on this day. So, in spite of all of this, in spite of Israel's unfaithfulness, in spite of Israel's utter contempt, the Lord remains committed to his covenant and to his people. And this is just the amazing love and the heart of our almighty God. Exodus 34, 5, then, the, then the, the Lord Yahweh came down in the cloud and he stood there and proclaimed his name, Yahweh. And this is in front of Moses. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, Yahweh, the Lord, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love, abounding in faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. This is an amazing love. Yet, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. And as we will see also in Revelation, the Jewish people will not be left unpunished. They will pay a tremendous price. But that's later on in Revelation. Leviticus 26 explains it eloquently. But if they will confess their sins and the sins of their ancestors, this being their ancestors, their unfaithfulness and their hostility towards me, me being Yahweh, 
which made me hostile towards them so that I sent them into the land of their enemies. Then, when, and he didn't say if, he says then, when their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they pay for their sin, I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with the Abraham and I will remember the land, Israel, the land of Canaan, the land of milk and honey. I will not reject them or abhor them so as to destroy them completely, breaking my covenant with them. I am Yahweh, their God. But for their sake, I will remember the covenant with their ancestors, whom I brought out of Egypt in the sight of the nations to be their God. I am Yahweh. And we will see this being played out in Revelation. Two books in the Old Testament or the, the, the prophets that help us understand, I think, a little more God's pain, anger, and his heart in all this. One is the book of Hosea and his instructions that God gave to Hosea. Hosea, chapter, starting chapter 1, when Yahweh began to speak through Hosea, the Lord, Yahweh said to him, go and marry a promiscuous woman. In other words, go and marry a whore and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to Yahweh. I will punish her for the day she burned incense to the bowels. She decked herself with rings and jewelry and went after her lovers. But me she forgot, declares Yahweh. Therefore, I am now going to what? You would think, well, he's not going to punish her. He's going to destroy her. No. I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. There. Where's there? In the wilderness. There she will respond as in the days of her youth. As in the day she came up out of Egypt, in that day, and we will see that time and time again in the Old Testament. Whenever God says in that day, what we're talking about is the day of the Lord. In that day, declares Yahweh, you will call me, not my master, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. I will betroth you to me forever. Wow. I will betroth you to me forever. You being the unfaithful woman that you have been, I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness and you will acknowledge Yahweh. Once again, we see a parallel that's beginning to unfold in Revelation 12.6 where the woman being Israel fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God where she will be taken care of for 1260 days. So this is just kind of leads up to what this story will be. It's an amazing story of God's amazing love for his people. Isaiah also helps us understand God's pain and anger and his heart in all this. Isaiah 54, 5. For your maker is your husband. Okay, we've heard that before. Yahweh Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. Okay, we've talked about that as well. He is called the God of all the earth. Yahweh will call you back as if you were a wife deserted and distressed in spirit. A wife who married young only to be rejected, says your God. 
For a brief moment, I abandoned you. But with deep compassion, I will bring you back. In a surge of anger, I hid my face from you. And for a moment, but with everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you, says Yahweh, your Redeemer. Wow. Later on, chapter 62, verse 4. No longer will they call you, you Israel, deserted, or name your land, Israel, desolate. For Yahweh will take delight in you, and your land will be married as a young man marries a young woman. So your builder marry you. So your builder marry you as a bride groom rejoices over his bride. So will your God rejoice over you. It's an amazing story with a lot yet to be played out and fulfilled in Revelation, which we will get to. So when Jesus... The Messiah returns. Israel's marriage covenant will be restored and fulfilled. Listen to this in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. And keep in mind everything that we now know about Yahweh, his marriage covenant, and his intention. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church. His body, of which he is the Savior, or we could also say he is the Redeemer. Now, as the church submits to Christ, or the Anointed One, or the Messiah, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her, what, holy, cleansing her by the washing with water. Now, wait a minute, cleansing the bride with water? That's the mikveh, Right? And we're going to read about that in Revelation 7. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will lead them to what? To springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So anyway, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church as a radiant bride, without stain or wrinkle or other blemish, but holy and blameless. This is the bride of Christ. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but fed and cared for their body, just as Christ does for the church. For we, you, me, us, we are members of his body. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. Now, we normally refer to this as a consummation of marriage. But what does it say in Ephesians? This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church, the bride of the Lamb. And we'll read about that later in Revelation 19, where um, it says, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory 
For what? For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people, the bride of Christ. So we're going to stop there because we're going to go into another main line of prophecy. So we have gone through um, the seed of the woman. We have now gone through the bride, the marriage covenant. And next we will go into what is Yahweh, the cloud rider, who will come and rescue his people. But that will be another discussion.